Hi everybody. It's two o'clock Eastern time on a Sunday and you guys had some really great questions um, for me. And I'm just gonna jump right in because there were so many and they were so, 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 so great. And um, some of them I've kind of condensed and uh, made into one question. Um, but I'm just going to go through these one by one. These are all your questions that I printed out. Um, Dawn Strong for Life asked if I'm competing this year. Absolutely. I'm definitely competing this year. I have two shows, one uh, at the end of the summer and I think one in early September. Um, another person asked, what does cut and build mean? And those are bodybuilding terms. A lot of you that have been lifting weights know what that means, but actually what it means is the cycle of bodybuilding. Once you decide that that's something that you want to engage in, um, on a yearly basis, there's, you know, there's an off season and an on season when there, there's bodybuilding shows and you pick the division you want to compete in. There's many different ones. Um, and many different age groups, not as many 60 plus, which I think they're going to be adding more, hopefully. Um, but after you do a show, you reverse out of your calorie deficit and you start building back in calories and food to build. So what you're trying to do is build back more muscle tissue by eating more. And then when you get close to contest season, contest prep, then you start cutting. So hopefully during that, I don't know, six to eight months that you weren't competing, but you were going to the gym and following your macros, but you were eating more to build muscle because you have to eat to build muscle. Deprivation and restriction of food really only happens when you're cutting. So what you're trying to do is strip away all the body fat so that all the muscle you gained during the build is more evident and that you know if you look at bodybuilders younger than me that have been doing this for 10 or 20 years or even five years you will see how their body changes their physique the body composition changes so much so they might start out looking kind of scrawny on stage in a bikini competition and then five years later they are so ripped and shredded because they've been building the muscle and it takes a long time to do that. Um, I don't know how much muscle I'll be able to build at my age, but you can build muscle absolutely at every age, but I don't have like a 30 year career ahead of me in bodybuilding. But some of these other women that started younger and do, it's really amazing to see how their physiques change. How much steady state cardio do you do and does it need to be fasted to see results? No. You don't have to be fasted. A lot of people do early morning cardio fasted just because they want to get out the door. They want to get it done. Um, steady state cardio. Someone also asked HIIT or steady state. So there's two kinds of cardio you can do. You can do high intensity interval training or low intensity steady state. And the high intensity interval training would be, for instance, you go out and you run as hard as you can for 15 seconds. Then for 45 seconds, you kind of do a moderate pace. And then you pick it up again, run really hard for 15 seconds, and then moderate for 45. Or it could be a 20-40 split as well per minute for maybe 15 to 20 minutes. I don't like doing high-intensity interval training. It taxes me on a level that um, I'm very protective of my heart because I have cardiac issues. I have uh, you know, residual heart disease from being a childhood diabetic and I had a triple bypass when I was 48, which was, what was that, like uh, 14, 12 or 14 years ago. I can't even do the math this morning, but anyway. And I just don't wanna tax my heart because you get up to a maximum heart rate that I don't think is healthy for me and it doesn't feel good and I don't enjoy it. I do enjoy a light jog once in a while, um, but low intensity steady state is a brisk walk or a bike ride, something where your heart rate 
is higher than normal, but and you keep it sustained in that higher than normal um, rate, and it burns fat. You will burn your fat stores for energy. If you do it fasted, it just sort of depends on your body. I mean, I don't know what research says, whether it's better or not. The fact is you just got to get outside and do it. So um, I really love steady state. And the coach that I'm following now, he really he really swears by um, walking. He says you, you can get shredded by walking. He has all his athletes walking. And when they're in contest prep and they're trying to cut, 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes at night. So that's an hour and a half of walking. How long did it take to firm up skin on your arms after weight loss? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. But I know I had bat wings for the longest time, and I had flabby skin. And even now, you know, I do have, like, crepey skin, but... Ladies and gents, this is kind of what happens when you age. Your skin is also an organ. Um, so I don't know how long it took. I just kept at it. I just kept at it. And you know you can't spot reduce. You have to lose fat all over and build muscle all over. Can exercise and lifting benefit neck and lower face muscles? Absolutely. A lot of people accuse me of having a facelift. I've never had a facelift. I, I, I weight lift, not facelift. Because, some, you know, I had this, like, chin, double chin, and sort of jowly. Um, but I've never had a facelift, no. So, yes, exercise can benefit the neck. That doesn't mean I don't have wrinkles here. But come on, you know, I'm 64. I'll be 65 next month. It comes with wrinkles. I'm 60 years old. Um, how do I get rid of my belly? Food, exercise, do's and don'ts. The thing about the belly, and I genetically, um, my mom, God love her, she passed a couple of years ago. She had a pouch. I mean, she had six kids, come on. But she had a, you know, it was like her lower abdomen. And, and all the women in my family, we inherited my mom's belly. And I just thought I'd never get rid of it. But when I was on stage last summer, it was gone. I you couldn't really see my abs because they weren't as developed. But again, you can't spot reduce your tummy. You're not going to get six pack abs unless you're really low body fat. It's just not going to happen. I think a lot of times these bodybuilders, again, that have been working on building muscle tissue year after year after year, maybe for decades, they, they can have abs year-round. I'm not that person, though. Does eating a number of times a day cause insulin spikes versus intermittent fasting? Insulin spikes, that's a really important thing. Your body can become resistant to the effect of insulin. And insulin is really good at storing food as fat. What you want the insulin to do is, is open your cells so that the energy can get in your cells and and you have, you know, you have energy to burn. Eating a number of times a day, no, it doesn't spike insulin or your blood sugar if your nutrition is on point. And by that, I mean you've got to have carbohydrate, protein, and healthy fat together five times a day. That's what keeps your blood sugar level. It won't spike your insulin. It won't cause your pancreas to say, oh, here comes some sugar. We got to handle this. But if you eat donuts first thing in the morning, if you have orange juice first thing in the morning, if you, you know, eat candy bars, drink soda that's got sugar in it, your pancreas is constantly pumping out insulin to meet the rise in blood sugar. And after a while, it will not go to your fat stores for burning. It'll just keep rising this insulin, insulin level, and that's where you become insulin resistant. That's why it's so important to avoid sugar. Now, I, you know, was diabetic for, gosh, from the age 11 to 34. Then I had a double organ transplant, which cured my diabetes. The diabetes had killed my kidneys, so my kidneys had failed. I would not have lived to be 40 without that transplant. 
But what I did learn is what my body can handle. So if I, I used to have a terrible sweet tooth. And what I do now is I, there's this little product called Scratch. I think it's called Scratch. And they're like little gummies and they're energy gummies. So if I'm at the gym and I feel my blood sugar is dropping because I do have a really good pancreas now, but sometimes she gets a little excited. I pop two of those in my mouth just to bring my blood sugar up and give me energy. So my recommendation would be if you've got a sweet tooth and you like gummies or whatever, candy, save it for the gym. Eat it before you have a lower body day because then your body can really use that glucose that goes right into your bloodstream and into your muscles. So no, eating a number of times a day does not spike your insulin or your blood sugar if you have the right nutrition. How many days do you train per week? I train five days a, uh, five days a week and um, I do an upper body and then a lower body or sometimes it's like t this morning it was triceps and shoulders, tomorrow it'll be my back, the day after that will be lower body, body maybe um, hams and glutes, and my routine varies. So I pretty much do the same exercises for six weeks and then switch it up because your muscles get used to it. Um, and then sometimes my training sessions last an hour and sometimes they last two hours. And I had a follower who sent me a message and said, you must not have a very good coach if you're in the gym for two hours. And I thought, really? Okay. She didn't understand that it takes time to put on and take off plates on the barbells. It takes time resting in between. I'm not a beast for two hours. I'm doing other things to prepare for the next exercise. And I'm very careful with my form and I'm very careful with like picking up weights. I don't want to get injured. So two hours doesn't mean I'm lifting straight for two hours. Do you do your workouts at a gym or do you have a home gym? I have both. I started at home. I have dumbbells at home from five pounds to 40 pounds, doubles each. I used resistance bands and also a Swiss ball. And <clears throat> when I start taking clients to coach, I'm gonna make sure that if you wanna work at home, we can do that. You don't have to go to a gym. If you wanna work in your own home, just, you know, there's like a min minimum amount of equipment that you can have. And then, you know, as you get stronger, you can get more. Cues to say, stay consistent, need that inner narrative. You know, this is so important, the mindset Mindset is everything. And my post today was about the mindset suitcase. Like, what do we put in there? Like, what kind of thoughts are we packing in there? And if it's negative self-talk, it's very hard to listen to that part of yourself that wants to be fit and lean and healthy. And we've all fallen into the trap of wanting to get fit because we hate the way we look. We look in the mirror and we're disgusted. I can't tell you how many times as a younger woman that happened to me and got me on the weight loss trail, but it was just be, it was in response to a negative thought about myself. Whereas this time in April, 2019, to stay consistent, I knew that this lean, strong person was in me and she wanted to come out. So I did everything I could from the first day to, to manifest that and now to maintain it because fitness is not a destination. It's a journey. It's ongoing. You have to maintain. Um, no questions. Nice to see you are well. Thank you, Gisela. You're so sweet. Any tips for sore and stiff joint relief? Um, Epsom baths. And I don't know if you're talking about after working out or waking up in the morning. First of all, talk to your doctor about why you do have stiff joints. Um, or you ache if it does if it's not related to fitness. If it is related to fitness, what happens is when you work out, you can end up getting delayed onset muscle soreness. It usually happens not the next day, but maybe the day after, and that's because there's been lactic acid buildup in your muscles. So the best way to offset that is do good stretching before and after your workout. Get a foam roller, which is like a big. Well, it's a big foam roller and you kind of roll your body on it. 
Um, I also take a soft tennis ball and put it on the wall and kind of go up and down to give myself uh, a back massage. And then there's a product called Calm, C-A-L-M. It's a powder, it's magnesium. It's basically a mineral drink with a little lemon taste to it. And you put it in hot water at night and drink it and it relaxes your muscles and also, you know, helps you sleep a little bit. Um, and the other thing would be to use ice or heat. And that kind of depends on what's sore and what's aching. And again, I would make sure that you check with your doctor to make sure that, you know, is it rheumatoid arthritis? Is it, you know, did you sprain something? Um, I really hesitate to give out any, and I don't give out any medical advice. I don't even like to tell people what supplements to take because I know for myself, I'm on medication for my organ transplant. It's like immunosuppressives and it interacts. It's contraindicated. It interacts with certain vitamins and herbs and all this stuff that they don't have enough research on. So I would never want to tell somebody what to take other than something benign like the calm that you can drink and that's just a mineral. Would you consider publishing a step-by-step -step workout log book? Yes, yes, that's my next book. Because I did write a memoir and that should come out this summer. Do you get sore? What do you do to avoid it? I really don't get sore. I do stretch. I make sure that I stretch. Source of protein and plant-based diet to achieve results and not affecting kidney and liver function. So yeah, some people are whole food plant-based diets. And another question I got was, you know, is can I do a macro diet using whole food plant-based? I would say that maybe macro is not the right approach if you are vegan or plant-based. That doesn't mean you can't, but you have a little more flexibility because there's a lot of food combining that can take place to give you your protein if you're plant-based. And I, my younger brother, who's in his 50s, He's an elite marathon runner. He's amazing. He does the Boston Marathon, the Chicago Marathon, and he's all plant-based, and he can't get over how great he feels. Now, granted, he's an endurance athlete. He's not lifting weights, but this is where you kind of have to experiment with your body and make sure that what you're eating and what you're doing is supporting your fitness goals. There's always a way. There's always a way. And the macro, the macro base plan of carbohydrate, protein, and fat, and breaking those up into a certain amount of grams works really well with the My Macros Plus app. If you are vegan or vegetarian, um, a lot of the food combining like rice and beans create uh, an amino acid protein, but it's also a lot of carbs. So that's kind of something I don't have expertise in. All I know is that it's doable. You can find a way to make it work for sure. The other thing I wanted to say is that a lot of my followers, I've had some followers say, I have to do keto because I can't do carbs. For me, keto was like, no, couldn't do keto. If you have kidney issues, too much protein, it's very hard on your kidneys. Besides that, I just can't subsist on protein and fat. That used to be the diet they gave people in the early 1900s before doctors Banting and Best discovered insulin. So when people had diabetes, it was considered a wasting disease. They would just waste away. And what were they fed? the fattiest steaks and meat that they could handle because carbohydrates would cause this blood sugar rush and no insulin to meet it and they would die a lot sooner. So it, ex it, it, it extended lives for a couple of years, um, but the body would begin feeding on itself. So I don't know if it's that psychological thing or it's just that I can't just eat protein. I've got to have carbs. But a lot of people are afraid of carbs because we know that unhealthy carbs help us gain weight, whether it's potato chips or donuts or pastries or this and that and the other. That's what people think of when they 
when they think of carbs. Now, something I've discovered about myself is that bloating can make you feel like you are really fat like your tummy distends and you feel like crap because there's inflammation in your body. There is a category of carbohydrates called FODMAPs, F-O-D-M-A-P, and that stands for um, the components in those foods that cause fermentation in your digestive system. So I avoid foods that are on that list. And after this um, Instagram Live, I will put up a FODMAP list of foods that don't cause inflammation and digestive issues in the body and the ones that do. So I found out I can't eat corn, watermelon, apples, um, and any like artificial sweeteners that are in gum that end with OL. And what happens is, the body, it, it's, fi, it's considered fiber, and so it goes right into your lower intestine, and it's not digested until it gets there. And when it gets there, it ferments. And a, a, a classic sign of that problem is irritable bowel syndrome or really smelly farts, really bad, <laughs> bad gas, but also distended tummy, not feeling good. So if a person says, I can't do carbs, look at the carbs you're, you're eating. A lot of them cause this issue and some of us can't handle it. How often should you adjust macros for weight loss? As soon as you start stalling, what you can do is cut back a little bit on your carb macros and up your cardio a little bit. So maybe you will cut back 50 grams of carb a day and you'll add 10 minutes a day of cardio. And I mean walking, I don't mean running. So maybe you're walking 30 minutes a day and your carbs are at 200 and you're plateauing, then I would bring your carbs down to say uh, 175 and bring your walking up to 40 or 45 minutes. And do that for a couple of weeks. And this is where weighing yourself every day does become informational but it doesn't necessarily tell the whole picture. So you want to use a a measuring tape as well. See how your body is tightening up. How many hours a week do you do your workouts? I think I answered that. What foods do you eat for fuel? Pre-workout, I make sure I've got protein, carbohydrate, and fat. So the most carbs I eat is in the morning before my workout and then my post-workout because you You use all that glycogen or all that fuel in your muscles when you're working out and then you have to replace it. Build and cut, I keep seeing, don't understand. I think he did that one. How heavy do you lift? Well, it depends. (laughs) I mean, you know, sometimes I can only do eight pounds and other times I can do 200 pounds on the leg press. So... It depends on the exercise and what part of the body. So every muscle in our body has a different uh, capability. What program did you use to start? Um, It was just, it was an online challenge where I was working out 30 minutes a day, six days a week and doing portion control. So I was in a program that kind of led me through sort of all these little things that you have to be aware of when you're trying to get fit. Does one do weight exercises different for different body types? Um, No, not really. There are different body types. Someone asked me about being a ecto, ecto mesomorph. So there's these somotypes. They're called somotypes. Body types are classified into three different, um, three different types. There's the uh, ectomorph. The ectomorph, the endomorph, and the mesomorph. And I just kind of jotted this down. I'm an ectomesomorph. A mesomorph is someone who's very muscular, has a lot of muscle. An ectomorph tends to be lean and linear, but lighter musculature. And then the um, endomorph body type is rounder and is more... mm, you know, has more of a predisposition to gaining fat. So you can eat according to your body type, but exercises, we all have the same biomechanics in our body. We all have the same 
circulatory, respiratory um, systems in our body. And I am absolutely blown away when I got my uh, certified personal training certificate. It was a year of study. I It just blew me away at how complex the body is and how all these systems need to work together. And when people say, oh, I have a bad metabolism. You know, metabolism is everything. It's everything working together. And fitness can help you get all those wheels turning together. Um, but a mesomorph, ectomorph, endomorph are basically body classifications. And those are things that you can't really change in terms of your genetics, you know. So I, when, when I'm at my, in an ideal weight state, I'm definitely um, a mesomorph, but not super muscular. So I'm a mesoectomorph because I tend to be more more linear. Um, someone is trying for a certain number of macros. She says, your fit vision, trying 40 carbs, 40 protein, 20 fat macros daily, but going over on fat macros. Any suggestions? Sweetheart, eat more food. That's like not enough food. That's not enough food for one day, 40, 40, and 20. So 40 carbs is 40 grams of carbs times four. That's 160 calories of, it's just of carbs, it's not enough. Protein, that's pretty good, 40. 20 of fat, that's not enough. So I suggest for macros that you take your ideal weight and you give yourself that many grams of protein times 1.2 to 1.5, okay? So I'm at 110 pounds and I am eating 140 grams of protein a day. And then I'm eating right now, I'm about 150 grams of carbohydrate. And you don't really want to go above 45 grams of fat. But your fit vision, you're not eating enough food at all. You have to eat more food. Of course, you go over your fat grams at 20 grams a day. That's nothing. Okay, how did you shed the fat layer when you know the muscles are right there? I think I answered that. When did you start training? April 2019. Do you eat just carbs before your morning workout or carbs and protein? Never eat just carbs before your morning workout. You won't have any sustaining energy at the gym. And sometimes in the morning, my husband, he's such a sweetheart, he brings me coffee in bed and I drink my coffee and then we go sit outside and have our breakfast. And sometimes we just get into, you know, these wonderful sort of husband-wife conversations. And before I know it, I've already eaten and an hour's gone by and I'm going to the gym and I've kind of missed that window. Um, so I always, that's what I take these little scratch gummies for because I feel like I, re I need that glucose intake. But no, I don't eat just carbs before my morning workout. That would, that would be a disaster for me. Uh, what do you use for healthy hair growth and nail health? Actually, I just make sure I get micronutrients in all the food. I take a multivitamin. That's about it. Fish oil. Um, that's about it. I, I'm not a big one for taking supplements. I just don't, you know, I don't know. That's not, it's not a regulated thing. But you, you don't know what's in that stuff. And all these companies are different. So I don't really, I drink a lot of water. Um, but I think high protein will help healthy hair and nails. Do you take or do anything to help sore stuff muscles after? Yeah, I think I answered that. If you're experiencing a plateau, how do you work with the mental aspect of it? The mental aspect is the long view. Do not feel like, first of all, fitness is, it takes time. Transformation takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> We have salads every night for a week and we wonder why, I think I put this in a story, why we didn't lose 15 pounds that week. We're so unrealistic. And I think that plateaus are a really good thing. Your body is saying, okay, I'm taking stock with what you're doing here. I'm adjusting. Give me time to get used to it. And 
you know, this is one reason these diets don't work where you, you right out of the gate, it's 1200 calories and hours of cardio. That is so unhealthy, so unhealthy. So what you want to do is feed your body close to what you're used to. So portion control, protein the size of your palm at each meal, um, carbohydrate the size of your fist, vegetables the size of cupped hands, fat the size of your thumb. Do portion control, cut out processed food, cut out sugar. If you can't do it all at once, tell yourself, okay, because I've got, I have pudding every night after dinner, rather than never have pudding after dinner, say, okay, next week I'm only gonna have it three nights a week, I can do that. And then the following week, okay, I'll just do it one night. And then the following week, okay, I'm cutting out the sugar. So it needs to be gradual. And as your body starts adjusting and, and releasing the fat, the body fat, and you're in the gym lifting weights, you're building muscle and you're losing fat. So you're building muscle and losing fat. Those are gonna even each other out. So you may not see the scale. You may say, I'm plateauing. But really what's happening is Muscle is coming into play and fat is being released, but you have to keep consistent, keep doing it. Use a tape measure, put on that pair of jeans that felt so tight forever. If those are fitting and your measurements are getting smaller, it's not a plateau. And the other thing is, if you really are on a plateau and you're just coasting and not losing weight, you've got to go into more of a calorie deficit. So you've got to start cutting back on your calories. But if you didn't just go right out of the gate at 1,200 calories, which is suicide, I think, diet suicide, um, you have room to bring it down and your body's comfortable with that. But if you just take it all away and say you can only have 1,200 or 1,000 calories, that is absolute torture. And we know it doesn't work. So plateaus, make sure you're really on a plateau. Best advice for those days when it just isn't coming together, give yourself grace. Take a day off. Just say, I need a mental health day to just not worry about anything and do self-care in another way. You know, maybe get a massage, maybe go out for coffee with a friend or dinner with your loved one or, you know, just don't be hard on yourself. Just give yourself grace and You'll feel better the next day. You will get a good night's sleep and don't worry about things. Do you have to watch your carb intake? No. Well, yes. I mean, <laughs> I measure my carb grams, um, but Sherry Vanya asks, do you have to watch your carb intake so it doesn't spike insulin? One thing is I don't take insulin anymore in shots because I'm not diabetic anymore but I always watch my carb intake. I don't have carb alone. Like if I ate an apple in between meal three and four, my blood sugar would spike. It's also that FODMAP and it would ferment in my lower intestine, I'd get bloated. Does that mean apples are bad? No, they're bad for me, but they're probably not bad for most of you. Does consistent strength training help with the insomnia that comes post-menopause? You know, insomnia, someone else asked about what, what's my sleep routine and, and um, what time do I go to bed? I'm usually in bed like between 9 and 10. And then I always wake up at 2 or 3. And some of you notice like I post on Instagram in the middle of the night because I can't sleep. Um, and that's probably not a good thing to get on my phone when I should be in a, in a sleep state, but strength training does help. So does cardio and eating enough carbs funnily enough will help you sleep better. So you might find that eating a, an easily digestible carb before you go to bed and rice cakes are great. They're easy to digest. They have no fat. Um, they've got about I don't know, 20 grams of carb, which is about, I don't know, 70 to 80 calories. Um, 
eating carbs before bed can help, but make sure it's in your plan. Don't just say, oh, okay, I'm going to have five rice cakes before I go to bed. Uh, but any kind of exercise definitely helps sleep. Drinking that calm helps. And some people take melatonin, which is an herbal supplement. I've tried it, but I don't, for myself, I don't like it because in the morning I'm too groggy. I just feel like, ooh, I can't get started. And I don't like that feeling. How should I start? That is like the million dollar question. How should I start? I don't know what to tell you, but I will tell you what I, someone asked, well, what, what was your elevator speech to the guy that was helping me with my website. So my website is hosted by Wix and I've been having trouble with the email. The contact forms all come and I respond, but if someone doesn't, if someone sends me an email to info at dolphinine.com, I have to go to another program to get that email. So he was helping me with that. And at the time he was also looking at my website. He goes, oh, okay, I could see what your business is about and why it's important that you get emails and everything. And and he helped me out. He's a really nice guy. And um, towards the end of our call, he says, anything else I can help you with? I said, no, you've been great. His name was Brett. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He goes, I weigh 350 pounds and I want to get fit. Can you give me any advice? And in a way, that's the question, how should I start? And what I told Brett was start slow, start walking start paying attention to what you're eating, cut out processed foods, sugary foods, and if you can, find a trainer who can walk you through a program and help you get comfortable in the gym. That's basically what I told him, but I also said, take it slow, be kind to your body, don't rush anything. I mean, if he weighs 350 pounds, um, a healthy weight loss rate in three or four years, he could be so buff. It's not going to happen in six months. It's not going to happen in a year. Um, even if he's in his 30s or 40s, it takes time. You don't want to injure your body any more than it already has been by overeating. And he was such a sweetheart. And it just felt so good to give him some hope and direction. And he was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to join a gym. My company pays for that. And so that was really, really wonderful. I currently live three days a week and do a total body workout each day. I'd like to increase to four days a week with more focus on upper body, lower body splits. What exercises would you suggest? And I'll watch your live today. Thanks. <laughs> okay, guys, so I have this book. I got this book three years ago. It's um, Weight Training. Idiot's Guide to Weight Training, okay? And I just wanted to know what other exercises were out there that would help me. And they've got all kinds of, you know, upper and lower body stuff that you can do at home. And it shows you which muscles it works. I know this is backwards on here. It shows you proper form. One of the things that bothered me about this is that these people in this book are super healthy, fit 20-year-olds. And here I was, 62, looking all out of shape and whatever. And it was hard to relate to. It was just like, okay. But anyway, now that I know some of the exercises and I look at this, I think, well, this might be a really good resource for someone who's who's working out at home. Um, <clears throat> the publisher, I don't know who the publisher is, Alpha, Idiot's Guide to Weight Training. Very simple book, but it's a way to get started and kind of figure out um, where you're doing. And what I would say is do the same exercises, upper, lower, splits for like six weeks and then change it up because your muscles get used to it. The key to muscle building, which is called hypertrophy. So when you lose muscle, it's called atrophy. When you build muscle, it's called hypertrophy. Um, you need to stress the muscle so much that you get these micro tears in your muscle that then need a day or two to recover and heal. And that's what, that's what um, builds the muscle. The only way to do that is if you push yourself. So there's something called 
progressive overload. So if you go in the gym and you're doing like five weight, five pounds in both hands, bicep curls forever, you're never going to build this muscle. It's like you aren't taxing the muscle. You're just like, I guess you'd call that toning, you know, but not, it doesn't do anything. So as soon as you feel like you can, you're maybe two reps away from failure, which means you just can't do another rep, then you know you've reached, you know, a good point. So the next time you go to the gym, instead of five pounds, try eight pounds. And then when you get up to, you can easily do 12, it's time to go even higher. So you might drop down in reps because your weight is heavier. The heavier the weight, <clears throat> the more you damage the muscle and the more you build muscle. And there's something called a one rep max, a one RM, which means, you know, when people say, well, how much can you bench press or how much can you hip thrust? Are they asking for 10 reps or are you asking for my one rep maximum? So whatever you could do in a one rep maximum and no more, that's at 100%. And then you might go down to 75% of that weight and start there with how much weight you're going to um, lift. I would say though, higher reps, lighter weight to begin. Don't start with heavy weights. Get to know your body, let your muscles wake up, let them get stronger. Uh, let's see, I don't understand the macro calorie formula. Okay, so this lady says, Mellow Steel says, I don't understand the macro calorie formula. Specifically, if I track my foods for three days and I'm eating 1,500 calories, let's say, then I split those calories into macros, five meals. This is where I don't get it. Isn't that just going to maintain my weight? How will I lose any? Okay, here's the thing. Also, I do work out already three to five days a week. First of all, if you're only tracking three days a week, I guarantee you, you're not eating 1,500 calories a day. You aren't. You aren't tracking, that's not good. We're a little OCD in the bodybuilding world in terms of you, you track everything you put in your mouth. And we weigh it in grams instead of cups and teaspoons because it's such an exact measurement when you, when you weigh in grams. But if you're only tracking three days a week, I'm assuming maybe on weekends you're like, eh, I'm not going to track. And if you're not tracking, you're going way over your calories. So if you're only maintaining weight, you don't even really know how many calories or macros you need to maintain weight because you aren't tracking four days a week. You're only tracking three. And then, um, yeah, it's just going to maintain your weight. If you want to lose weight, you need to be in a calorie deficit and you need to know how much you're eating. And this is probably, I hear this from a lot of coaches. This is a lot of what um, clients don't understand about tracking and, and, and some people don't like to track and that's okay too. You don't have to do macros. You don't, there's no, di the best diet in the world is the one that you can stick to and that you have control over and you're satiated and you don't feel deprived. And it might take months and months and months to get to a point where you are in such a calorie deficit that you begin losing that weight. But if you had started out there, you would no longer be trying because it's just too hard. So small, small steps and track every day. Um, does one do weight exercises different for different body types? No, oh, that I already answered that. And um, there's a few more questions. Uh, beginner workouts, how long, sets and reps? Beginner workouts, I would say 30 minutes a day, six days a week, just doing simple, maybe, you know, one day do upper five upper body exercises. And when I get my platform set up, that's going to be an option for people. Here's a program you can do for the next six weeks. And here's the exercises you should do. It won't be one on one with macros and there'll, there'll be that information there. But I know not everybody can afford uh, a trainer. Plus, I can't take everybody that wants me to train them. But I do want to share the information 
so that people can get the results that, that they want. Um, should I be doing five times fifth five times fifteen sets arms each day or second day? I think what you're asking is, uh, should you do an upper lower body split? So one day you do arms or upper body, and one day you do lower body. It's always good to have a day in between to let that part of the body rest and recover. And this is also why sleep is so important because our bodies go into cellular repair when we're sleeping. It's really um, just as important. Sleep is so important. I was, um, for some reason, I had terrible insomnia a few weeks ago, and I weigh myself every day because it gives me uh, a barometer of, I'm going to be starting to cut here for my contest this summer, and it, it shows me how my my macros are working with my weight training and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I didn't sleep one night, all night. I think it was a combination of husband snoring and <laughs> coffee late in the day and dogs getting up and wanting to go out. Anyway, I didn't sleep. And I got up the next morning and I had gained five pounds. Overnight, five pounds. And I'm like, I know exactly why that happened because I didn't sleep. And the body does these weird things to compensate Stress is also a way where you get up in the morning, you're like, three pounds, four pounds, where did that come from? Your body creates cortisol under stress, which, you know, you could have too much sodium in your meal the night before. There's so many factors. So just keeping that in mind that that kind of stuff um, fluctuates. Uh, rest activities, like on rest days, what to do on rest days. Light cardio is great, like maybe an easy walk, not a brisk walk. Yoga is great. Get a massage. Do some stretching. Be kind to your body on rest days and just enjoy it. I, it used to be hard for me to take days off from the gym just because, you know, I'm so like into going. Um, and I told Brett the other day, the computer guy on the phone, I said, when I started working out, all I did was think about working out when I wasn't working out, which is just, I don't know. Um, okay, the high protein, someone's having bowel issues with the high protein. Yeah, that can be an issue if you're not, in, but it may, you know, eating more fiber is helpful. There's like little over-the-counter things you can take, like Metamucil that sort of will bring the water through your digestive system and help things move through but again that's like make sure you don't have some medical um issue that that is affecting you like that and let's see those are all my questions i got that was a lot you guys had such great questions so here's what i want to tell you i'm putting together some workshops one will be on macros and another one is going to be on your shadow self your shadow self, like that inner woman that lives, and there could be several, that lives inside of you and says, mm, you're not good enough, you can't do this, blah, 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 blah. There's a really good reason you've got these shadow selves. And sometimes if you can identify her, you can learn what it is she's trying to tell you. She's got a lot of wisdom to share. In fact, she is a manifestation of your desire to have more control over your life. And so not to discount the shadow self or selves, but to get to know her and see what she has to say and why she's hung around for so long. So one of my shadow selves is, um, you guys are so kind and you tell me, oh, you're so sweet and la la la. But I lived in New York City for five years, and you have not seen that girl who lived in New York City. Don't cross me. It's some guy or whatever. If anybody, you know, it's like there is, a, there is this warrior in me, and when she comes out, she can be a total, total bitch. And hopefully not to somebody, but it's just sort of this, this persona that lives in me. And, and when I look at that, shadow self she's wearing armor 
and she's hard edged and she's like protecting herself. And I really had to look at that and say, what, well, how did I get this shadow self? And they, these are defense mechanisms that we create from childhood. Um, but these shadow selves, I was reading about another woman who she did a workshop where she, um, got in touch with her shadow self. And one of, one of them was this really uptight librarian, like, you know, collar up to here, really prim and proper and really uptight and whatever. And then her other shadow self was this motorcycle, black leather wearing badass of a woman. And she realized that they represented different parts of her personality that helped her navigate life. And it can be kind of a fun thing to explore that and find out what it is that these parts of ourselves. And that's part of the finding out why do we self-sabotage? Why do we like have the best intentions and then we're just like, oh, screw it, I'm not doing this, or I, you know, whatever it is. So I think it's worth looking at those things. Um, I am not a psychologist. I'm, I just share what has worked for me. And um, so I think in some of the workshops going forward, it's going to be mostly um, things to help you that I've used that have that have helped me. And fitness is a never ending knowledge base. I keep learning more and more and more and I love sharing it. So um, also what, what it will be will be on Zoom so we can have some give and take rather than me just blah, blah, blah. Um, and if you guys want any particular topics discussed, you can always send me a direct message or, uh, a, you know, a comment in Instagram. I've noticed there's coaches that, and I'm one of them, where we just love to talk about this stuff because it's so fascinating. And if somebody says, well, what about this? Or I'd love to know more about that. It's like, I am an educator. That's what I did as a career as well as an artist for the last 40 years and I love sharing information. So um, just, and I don't answer all DMs because sometimes I just don't have the time or I miss it or whatever. So don't take it personally if I don't see your message or answer it. And let's see, it's 2.52. I'm seeing all these hearts kind of float up. So I wanna thank you guys, all of you for being here today. Um, hopefully I hit my followers that are across the pond in Europe and I even have some in Russia. I have some in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, um, China, Japan. I hope this time is good for all of you. And then my lovely followers in Brazil. I have a lot of followers in Brazil and South America and of course US, Canada, all over. And that's what I love about Instagram and that's what I want to expand so that we can all interact, support each other, have a live platform, and it's getting closer. Just be patient because I have other things I have to finish first. And as soon as that launches, you will be the first to know if you're on my mailing list. And if you're not on my mailing list, go to the link in bio and click on contact form, fill that out, and just send, send it off, and I'll have your email. And the email won't be used for anything but notifying you when I do a workshop or when I start coaching or when this platform is up. So it's all very secure and um, doesn't belong to anybody but me. Okay, you guys, happy, happy Sunday and um, I'll see you on Instagram. Thank you so much for spending Sunday with me. It was, it was wonderful. So you guys have a great rest of your day. And this will be recorded and I'll put it on Instagram if somebody missed it. Okay, guys.